So, um, so yeah, so this week kind of builds on what, what we talked about last week, right? So if, if, if we are the church, congregationalism, um, we have the authority to bind and loose. We talked about last week, Matthew 16 and 18. Um, what is binding and loosing, right? And so um, discipline, in short, is um, membership in practice. So um, we can put, yeah, there you go. What is, what is church discipline? So in short, it's correcting sin. Um, it's correcting sin when we talk about church discipline, right? Um, and so it is a part of discipleship. So if you notice, discipleship and discipline both have that same root word. Um, they're not, they obviously don't mean the exact same thing, but um, they, they have the same root. They come from the same idea. Um, it's to um, correct sin and pursue Jesus. So we'll go to the next slide. I'm not going to go through all of these. If you want, you can just take your phone out, take a picture of the references on the screen. Uh, but this is where we see discipline, specifically church discipline in the New Testament. Uh, Matthew 18, we're going to look at that later today. Um, same with 1 Corinthians 5. Um, those are the two big ones. We also see in 2 Corinthians, they actually kind of, Paul follows up on the issue from um, so 1 Corinthians, it says 15, I'm sorry, I put this in, that's a typo, it's 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5. Um, Galatians 6 says that, you know, if, if we're, we are commanded to gently restore a brother that's caught in transgression, um, Ephesians 5 says that we're supposed to expose the unfruitful works of darkness, 1 Thessalonians 5 says, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Um, 2 Thessalonians 3 says that we are to warn those who disobey. Um, as brothers, and then ultimately having nothing to do with them if, if they continue on. Um, 1 Timothy 5 says that uh, pastors who persist in sin after being confronted um, in the witness of two or three, they should be rebuked in the presence of all so that all might stand in fear. Um, 2 Timothy 3 says that we're supposed to avoid those who claim to be godly, but then don't walk in the power of the Spirit. Um, Titus 3 says, you know, as, as for a divisive person, warn them, warn them twice, warn them once, warn them twice. If, if they don't listen, um, have nothing to do with them. And then James 5, we went through, when were we in James? In the fall? Sometime in the fall. Um, we are supposed to bring back those wandering from the truth for the sake of their soul. So um, that's an overview. Again, you can look at that. Also, I apologize. It's 1 Corinthians 5, not 15. So if you take a picture, just scribble out the one um, there. I mean, 1 Corinthians 15 is awesome, but um, 1 Corinthians 5 is the chapter where they're dealing with um, sin. So, all right, next slide. The purpose of discipline. Um, there are seven main purposes, I think, we see in Scripture. I think four are on this slide, and the three are on the next ones. So, um, first, in Matthew 18, we see that it renders judgment in heaven's name. Um, second, we see in 1 Corinthians and Ephesians, that discipline exposes. Third, we see that discipline warns. Fourth, we see that it saves. Fifth, we see that it protects. Um, sixth, we see that it preserves the church's witness. And lastly, we see that it instills the fear of the Lord, which Proverbs says is the beginning of all wisdom. Um, so, the question is, what sins do we discipline? Um, in, in general, here's, here's just a good rule of thumb, and this is kind of from a biblical examination of all the church discipline that we'll just distill down. Um, the criteria that we kind of, I think is helpful, is outward, serious, and unrepentant. Outward, serious, and unrepentant. Um, <clears throat> outward, obviously Jesus says, you know, there needs to be two or three witnesses. Multiple times it, it's, it calls for witnesses over and over and over. Um, so if, if you just see maybe pride is welling in someone's heart, don't just like pounce on them and be like, we're going to the church. Um, that's, it's got to be like an outward sin, right? Um, now, obviously, if pride manifests itself in, in some very outward, serious ways, um, but somebody residually trying to put to, like having residual pride in their heart, trying to put that to death, I don't think is, is a thing that we discipline. Um, the second one, serious, <clears throat> This sin should leave us feeling like if, they can, if, if they're walking in this, 
um, we can't affirm their profession of faith. So we talked last week about congregationalism and affirming their profession of faith. Um, and so, like, if somebody's, like, walking in adultery, I'm like, okay, that's a thing where we go, hey, that causes me to question your faith. Um, you know, you're obviously not loving your wife in that way. Now, <clears throat> if, if you eat the last bite of ice cream and don't give that to your wife, I don't think that that's like a church discipline level, right? So, like, love your wives, but obviously those two things are very different, right? Um, that's still selfish, like, give her the ice cream. Um, but I think those are very different um, levels. I wouldn't question if someone's a Christian if they want the last bite of ice cream, right? Um, and then unrepentant, um, <clears throat> from, from all appearances, when, when we discipline a member, um, what that's saying is that the disciplined member seems to prize Jesus more than their own sin, right? They've, they've been confronted, they've walked through this process, which we'll get to in one second. Um, this is why there's so many steps to discipline, right? This is why over and over and over we're calling for repentance. Um, and so there, there's this weird, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, there's this weird dance of moving um, I think there is some haste in which we should move, but there's also a lot of patience in which we should move um, with, with discipline. Um, but basically, when, when we get to the end of the church discipline process, which is, if you've ever asked someone who's walked through it, it's never fun. We don't enjoy doing this. Um, in fact, I wish I never had to do it. Um, but you come to a point where you're just like, I, I can't, like, every, everything about this is just showing you love sin more than Jesus. And like, I, like God's word says we have to do this. So there's really nothing else we can do at this point. Um, so I'll, I'll put up also on the next slide we have, <clears throat> here's just some other disciplined sins that maybe don't necessarily fall into those clear cut categories, but here's what we see in scripture. Obviously heretical teaching, um, in Galatians we see is, is disciplined. Um, people who, who try to stir up division. Um, and obviously, these, these are people who do these things and then are warned and then don't repent and they continue to do them. Um, a persistently disorderly or wasteful lifestyle and then church leaders who disqualify themselves. Um, so let's, let's get into the steps, um, which is the next slide. So how do we do discipline? So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew 18. You can turn to Matthew 18. Um, if you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles underneath the seats in front of you. So there are four steps to discipline. Um, now, if, if you want, this is a shameless plug, you can go back and listen to our sermons, Matthew 18. Uh, we did three sermons on this chapter the first one, it's really important to remember this context, right? Because the first one um, deals a lot with your own personal sin, right? Um, and temptations to sin. And then it, it leads into the story of the lost sheep, right? Which, which is, is the shepherd who leaves the 99 to go rescue that one straying one. And then right after that context... Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens, you've gained a brother. But if he doesn't listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two or three agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. And then, um, we'll, I'll get to this in a minute, but then the very next parable, Jesus still in the same sermon, um, he tells the story of, of the servant who is forgiven, basically, I think it was like 200,000 years wage, right? He was forgiven this, um, this huge, like this, this debt he would never be able to pay back. And then he throws a man in jail for three months' wage. Um, and, and Jesus really uses that to say, if we've been forgiven this much, we should also forgive our brothers and sisters. Um, so, let's walk through these steps. Um, the first one is private correction. Um, we see that in verse 15. 
By, by the context of church discipline, this is a brother or sister that's walking in sin, refusing to turn from it, right? And so when somebody sins against you and refuses to turn from it, we, we lovingly go to them privately, right? We address it privately. Um, and, and let me add, we should love our brothers and sisters enough to address this, right? We don't just let this slide. Um, you don't just come to church and ask the pastors, hey, I've been noticing this thing with so-and-so and so-and-so. I'm like, well, have you asked them about it? That's all, I will always ask you that, right? Well, have you talked to them about it? Um, we should love this person enough to not sit back and watch them walk into sin, right? We should love them enough. So um, this, this step does not involve any like organization or a group of believers. You don't need to come tell your pastors about it. Like this is just the, this is a one-on-one step. Um, it's, it's not an intervention, all right? So don't just like blindside somebody by putting 20 people in their living room um, if you haven't even done this step yet, okay? This is between you and the other person in the context of relationships. And I say on, on this level, this per, private correction, church discipline should actually be happening probably daily in the lives, in our lives, right? Um, we, we should constantly be um, like discipline and discipling kind of go hand in hand, right? Um, and so those go together. And then if they respond properly, which I think like 95%, I may, maybe I'm making that number up, from my experience, a large, large, large majority of the time, it works that step. And then that's done. And so Jesus says, rejoice, you've gained your brother back. Um, and then you have a shared communion with Christ that gets so much deeper. Like that's the goal and that's the hope. Remember, this, we're running after the one sheep that's strayed, right? Hey, you're running away, come back to the flock. Like come, come back um, to Christ. So if we get this step right, um, and, and prayerfully and hopefully this person receives the correction, um, that's the end of church discipline, uh, that step. Okay, but if that doesn't work, then step two is small group clarification. This is not to gang up on a brother or sister in sin. Um, <clears throat> those, those that are brought into the process at this point should hopefully be gentle, humble, loving, and willing people, right? Um, not someone that's just like rubbing their hands and being like, I can't wait till I get to get into church discipline, right? Like that's not, it's not the attitude we want there. Um, typically, it's, it's good to involve people that are like in, in their lives and know these people well, so you're not just grabbing a random person. Um, because having a deep relationship with the person, I think, brings a sense of tenderness and humility and graciousness um, to that correction. Um, again, I don't think a church leader needs to be brought in at this point. That's just my view. Um, you can if you want. It's not forbidden. Um, but basically, what, what bringing two or three together um, is, hey, it's not just this one person that noticed this, right? Um, we're all noticing this, and so, and it's serious enough that when we said, hey, quit doing that, um, you know, then the, the person goes, no, no, I'm going to continue doing it, and it's like, no, no, really, like, we, we all, we're all telling you, like, really, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing this, like, you, you are openly and unrepentantly walking in sin, and I think it shows the severity of the sin, right? Um, somebody just telling me, hey, you should be kinder with your words, that, that means one thing, but when two or three people sit me down and go, hey, Michael, we've noticed this pattern, we've tried to address it with you before, yeah. that just sends, obviously, a very different, different message and shows me how much more serious it is than, than maybe I was taking it. All right, step three, then, if that doesn't work, which, again, hopefully and prayerfully, that's what, that's what we're hoping, right? We're hoping and praying for repentance, um, is church admonition. This is where, um, this is kind of where church membership gets, gets really important. This is where it gets its teeth. Um, the tone here is not, hey, we're calling a meeting to tell everyone about your sin, but rather, we all love you so much, and, and you've submitted to us, we've committed to you, and, and we are calling you back to Jesus, right? We're calling you back to be a true gospel confessor, like you say you are, right? And so we're calling you back to that. Um, one author puts it this way. He says, God loves us so much that if we're caught in sin, he will send an entire army of believers to demonstrate his love and mercy, right? And so, obviously, again, you would hope at that point that the person would repent. Um, if they don't, then we see at the end of verse 17, 
excommunication is the word. That's not the biblical word. That's just the word that the church uses. Um, but it is, it is to remove somebody from um, membership. So when somebody refuses to repent after being confronted by the entire church, right? And this is not just an elder thing. It doesn't say bring it to the elders. It doesn't, maybe your translation, mine doesn't say that there, right? This is something we bring to the church. Then, if they refuse to repent after that, then we're to treat him like he's no longer our brother in Christ, no longer a part of the church body. Now, a disciplined person obviously can still come to church, still do almost every single thing that anyone here would do, um, except things that we reserve distinctly for Christians, right? Like the Lord's Supper is probably the biggest one. Um, And so this is called excommunication. It's basically expelling somebody from the church. Um, I know that this step sounds insanely harsh, but um, I I think what we have to come to is, well, Jesus commands it, right? And so um, it's, it's, it's required, um, as, as harsh as it might sound, um, it's not optional. And I think if we fail to do this, I think then we are now walking in sin um, if, if we don't actually hold our brothers and sisters accountable. Um, and so I think that kind of works for all steps, but I think this one, because a lot of people get really weird when it comes to this, like the last two steps, um, because it's, it is uncomfortable, it is awkward, nobody likes doing it. Um, again, I, I mean, you can ask Robert, you can ask Jim, you can ask anyone that's kind of walked through this process before. Um, it, it brings no one joy to do this, um, but we do it out of love and out of um, devotion to the Word of God. So, and, and this truly is, I think, removing somebody from um, church membership after all of this, right, when we have no other option, it is truly for the good of the individual, but also for the good of the church. Um, it, it truly is. The individual, it shows them, it says, hey, you are walking in sin. And, and now these Christians that once affirmed that we think you're a Christian, we, we now can't really affirm that anymore. Um, and for the sake of the church, we see in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul says, remove the evil person from among you for one little bit of leaven will leaven the whole lump of flour, right? Um, and so let me give a few notes on that process. Um, a few notes. First, we have to come from a place of humility. We have to. We absolutely have to come from a place of humility. Remember the context, right? Jesus has been modeling humility. um, And even though, I mean, just like look at the cross, right? Jesus on the cross was the one who was right, right? Everyone else in the situation was wrong. Every single other person in the situation was wrong, yet he exemplified humility because what was he doing in that moment? He was laying down his life so that his sheep could come back to the fold, right? This is a good shepherd, laying down his life for his sheep. So he, he truly had, I mean, you read the parable of the lost sheep here, and I'm like, well, that's, that's exactly what Christ does for us, exactly what he does for us. So we have to come from a place of humility. We also have to have the good of the person at the forefront of our mind. Like, this is for the good of the person, right? You, if, if you have bitterness towards somebody, you don't come and start rebuking them right? That's not how that works. Um, in fact, yesterday we actually had, um, Robert and Jim and I, we had a meeting with someone who started it with, hey, I have bitterness towards you. Let me repent of that. I, I'd, I'd like to kind of talk through some other things that I think you guys let me down on for, but first it was the, just this open repentance and admission of their own sin. Um, and I mean, that drastically sets the tone differently than if you just come in and go, hey, let me tell you what to fix, right? and I'm angry at you, right? Those are two very different things. Um, and we have to remember, what we're trying to do is we're trying to bring the lost sheep back. We're not trying to scold them. We're trying to restore them. Um, so we, we don't want people to continue to sin. Um, obviously, the intended purpose or hope or goal of this entire process is that this Christian, this person that we're disciplining, would acknowledge their sin, confess their sin, repent of their sin, and thus reconciliation would be enacted, right? Um, if, if you're ever going through this process, let patience and prayer mark you, right? Let patience and prayer mark you. This is not a process to rush. Most of these steps um, involve multiple, multiple, multiple meetings, um, we don't rush this. We don't take it with haste. Um, we, we want to be patient. We want to be prayerful. 
Um, the length of the disciplinary process, I think, it is a matter of prayer. Um, it is something, I think, a matter of divine wisdom, too. Um, because obviously, like, haste is demanded, right? If somebody's walking in sin, you need to help show them, hey, this is serious. This is, like, your soul is at stake here. Um, but in another sense, you don't want to just rush through the process and um, not give them time to repent or even, um, yeah, you don't want to cut short the time and, and, and not let the Spirit work on them to bring them to a place of repentance. Does that make sense? I think that, that kind of like you, you do need to obviously move forward when you have to, um, but don't like be just itching to get to the next step. Um, I, I'm always like, I'm, I'm pleading with this person. I'm like, I really don't want to go to the next step. Um, please, please, please repent. That needs to be um, kind of how we do it. And then um, another note on this is that Jesus does delegate divine authority to the church to exercise discipline. Notice, looking back at Matthew, in verse 18, Jesus gives us his authority, right? In verse 19, he gives us his support. And in verse 20, he, gu- he guarantees us his presence. Um, now, again, Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead, right? And so churches, like when I say Jesus gives us the authority, um, I'm not saying that if, if a church disciplines someone right or wrong, that that's, well, that means they're going to hell or not, right? Um, we, we, we need to do our best because we've been given the weighty responsibility of rendering judgment in heaven's name. Um, but it, it's, it's a declarative sign, right, of, of the, the best that we can see. Um, it is a declarative sign of divine judgment, right? Um, although it's not definitive. Does that make sense? It's, it's declarative, not definitive. Um, so, And so because of these divine sanctions, Christians should willingly submit to discipline as carried out by the church because Jesus, the head of the church, right, um, he's put them then under discipline for sin, right? And so Christians then who have been released from church discipline, um, meaning that they've repented, they should rejoice, right? They should rejoice. Um, they, if, if, if you have walked through the process of church discipline and you found repentance and maybe guilt just starts to well up in your heart, like, remember the gospel, right? Remember that, that the grace of God and the love of Jesus covers that sin, right? Uh, it's, it's not just a, well, now you're back in, but we're just going to kind of sit you over there in the corner. It's like, no, no, no. Jesus says rejoice. You've gained your brother. That's, that's always the hope. That's always the goal. Um, <clears throat> let me see. Where was I? Okay. Um, and then, yes, it, it protects the church from the spread of sin within its midst, um, both by removing the unrepentant sinner and multiple times throughout Scripture, it says, so that the church might stand in fear. So that the church might stand in fear. Um, so... All right, let me get into some of these questions, and then I'll open it up for you guys to ask questions. So, what does excommunication say, right? What, what does removing somebody from a church say about that person? Again, it, it does not say, hey, they're now going to hell. Um, what, what it's saying, and it doesn't even declare for certain, hey, this person is not a Christian. What it's saying, as we remove a person from membership and participation in the Lord's Supper, um, it's a way of saying we as a church body, we no longer can affirm that you're a Christian, right? We've, we've, we've tried. Um, we can't publicly, by, by what we see in your life and us calling you to repentance and using God's word, right? This is not a council of opinions, right? This is, I'm going to hold your life up next to God's word and go, this isn't matching up. I've called you to repentance and you've said no multiple times in multiple different ways, right? Um, and so we're just saying we, we can't then affirm that you're a Christian because this is what we think Christians do. Um, basically, like, it's the opposite of affirming a member, right? It's the opposite of affirming a member. A- affirming a member says you profess to be a follower of Jesus, um, and you look like you are one. So we publicly testify. We agree with you, and so we will commit to you. We will submit to you as you commit to and submit to us, right? That's what membership does. And so essentially... If membership involves the church's public affirmation of that profession, um, discipline then involves the removal of that 
affirmation, right? The removal, and I'm not saying everyone who stops being a member is disciplined. Um, I'm just, where I'm talking specifically on cases of church discipline, excommunication. Essentially what the church is saying is we no longer can affirm this. We can't. Um, a church comes to a point where after multiple attempts to call a person to repentance, it, it feels dishonest and um, inconsistent with our witness that um, we would continue to affirm this person's profession of faith, right? So even if a person professes to be a Christian, if they're choosing sin over Jesus, insisting, I can keep both, what they're doing is they're saying, well, I really, I, I, I love sin more than Jesus because I'm not willing to give that up. Um, so that's basically what it's saying. Um, so a few on excommunication, just two two questions I think I've thought of and maybe have been asked before. First is, what if someone s- stops being a Christian or stops calling themselves a Christian, right? What if somebody takes their faith back? I don't know. Whatever language you want to. They said they were a Christian, and now they say, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. What do you do with that? Um, personally, I, I think that they should just resign as members. I don't think they need to be disciplined um, because there's not really a public record to correct, right? Like they've, they've admitted, they say, I no longer hold to the gospel. I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in Jesus. Um, there, there's not really anything, like they've, they've already corrected himself or herself, saying, I'm not a Christian, right? Because remember, discipline is, is somebody saying, I think I can be a Christian and then continue to walk in this sin, right? Um, and so I think if somebody's saying, well, I'm not a Christian, I'm, I'm gonna not be a member of a church. I'm gonna reject all of the means of grace that God has given to me to call me to repentance, um, I think they've kind of done it to themselves. Um, and so church discipline does, um, it, it, so in 1 Corinthians 5, what Paul says is, he says, With, withhold the hand of fellowship to, quote, anyone who, name, who bears the name of brother, right? And so th- I think that's helpful language um, if somebody's bearing the name of brother yet living in unrepentant sin, that's kind of what we discipline there, all right? So that's one question. The second question is, um, well, okay, if somebody's disciplined, then, then what do we do with them, right? How do we interact? With, like if I run into so-and-so at the grocery store after they've been excommunicated, um, excommunication, church discipline, I think it breaks Christian fellowship, but not like human fellowship, if that makes sense. Um, so we, we see them out. Um, obviously, talk to them. Say hi. We've been praying for you. We love you. Um, I would even go as far as to be like all of. I mean, you should continue after somebody is removed from a church for discipline. I think you should continue to reach out to them and call them to repentance. Because um, again, I, I don't think even when it's even when you get to the step number four, I don't think it's just done then right? I'm like, that's all the more time to be more fervent in prayer um, and, and to really press in, really call to repentance um, because we're going, we, we want you to come back to the church, back to faith in Jesus. Um, and, and right now, we all don't think you're there. And so, um, lovingly, but gently, but yet firmly, um, call them to repentance. I think if, if that's within a family, like let's say a husband or a wife, gets disciplined and the other spouse is still a member here, um, I, I, I don't think that instantly you're like, all right, well, then you two just stop talking. And every single time at the dinner table, the spouse got to call that spouse to repentance, right? Like that, I think would, but um, like if, if a spouse gets disciplined, um, the other spouse, I think, should still fulfill their duties as what? God calls them as a husband or as a wife or a father or mother, right? Like, I don't, if, if, if my spouse got disciplined, I wouldn't just go, well, I don't need to lay my life down for you anymore um, because, well, you're not a Christian. So um, that's not, no, that's not at all the case, right? Um, we're continue to love, and I would even say be all the more faithful then in showing what a godly spouse does because it pictures the gospel, as we saw a couple weeks ago in Ephesians chapter 5. Um, so, like kids, if your parents get excommunicated, you still obey them, right? Um, yes, we do. Um, so, 
still, I don't think that the family relationships are broken, but the, the Christian relationships are broken, if that makes sense. Um, all right, now, on a way, way, way lighter note, what does restoration look like? Okay, this is the goal, right, the hope. Um, restoration looks like forgiving as we've been forgiven, right? It's forgiven, be forgiving as we've been forgiven. This is why Jesus follows up this section on church discipline with then Peter comes up to him and says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, right? Like, do I need to really, I mean, if my, if, if my brother keeps sinning against me, how many times do I have to keep forgiving him? And then Jesus launches into that parable, right? We've been forgiven this much. And essentially Jesus, I mean, he says 70 times seven, which is basically like always, right? Um, you shouldn't stop forgiving your brother. Um, and so if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, um, that was one of the, the passages that was up at the beginning. Um, so in 1 Corinthians 5, there was a man being disciplined for sleeping with his stepmom, right? And so Paul kind of walks them through all of this. Um, and then, this is fascinating. I, people don't know if, if this is exactly in, I think you can make an argument that this is speaking of that issue, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul writes back and says, for such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him that he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you, reaffirm your love for him, right? And so what that means is a, a majority, whether that was the th issue from 1 Corinthians 5 or a separate, separate issue, a, a majority of the congregation deliberately acted, or in our language, voted, um, to punish an individual, to excommunicate them. And, and Paul is now telling them, assuming that repentance has then happened, Paul is telling them to forgive comfort and reaffirm their love for this brother, right? Reaffirm their love for this brother. So when, when we restore a repentant sinner, we're restoring fellowship at the Lord's table, right? There's, there's no talk of probation period, like, all right, well, why don't you prove to us that you've repented, right? Um, why, why don't you do some time of, of penance, or um, we'll put you in like the second class citizenship for just a time being, and then when you prove yourself, then you'll be invited to be, act, you know, back to the table. Um, I think from John chapter 20, we see that, that if, 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 if we publicly remove somebody from membership, I think we also should publicly um, pronounce our forgiveness for them um, if, if they've repented and, and want to be back. Um, the church should affirm our love for the repenting individual, um, and we should celebrate, right? We should celebrate. Just like, I mean, think of the, the parable Jesus gives. We all know the parable of the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son runs off, lives like he's not a son at all to his father, finally comes to grip with himself, and comes back. And what does the father do? Before he's, before he's even at, like, the door, he runs out, puts his coat on him, gives him his ring, and says, get the cow. We're going to have a feast. I'm going to invite the whole town. Like, there is nothing happier than what just happened. My son's back, right? So let's rejoice. Let's celebrate. Um, now, this doesn't always mean we have to reinstate them as a member here. Like, if somebody got disciplined and moved, obviously, I'm not like, well, just, no, you're going to be a member again. Like, that's not, that just logistically doesn't make sense. Uh, but typically, it does, right? Typically, um, that somebody's just admitted right back into membership, um, once the church affirms, hey, we forgive you, we love you, we're going to celebrate um, your repentance. So, the million-dollar question. Is it loving to practice church discipline? Is it loving to practice church discipline? Um, let me say something this about the term love. Um, I think if, if we see what God calls us to in His Word and we say that's not loving— um, maybe it's not God that needs to be reevaluated, but our, our definition of love. Does that make sense? Um, because, in, in, in fact, even in our society, which is just a love, love is love, right? Every, accept everyone, right? Love everyone, love everything. Um, even our society's huge, big picture of love that, that it likes to promote, um, that version of love still corrects, it still makes judgments, and it still imposes its own truth right? 
It does. Um, and even that love excommunicates informally, right? Um, our culture's definition of love and approach to love is, if you don't let me be who I am and love who I want to love, you're bigoted, you're intolerant, and you're hateful. I can't have any communion with you. I can't even talk to you, right? That, I mean, that's excommunication, right? So our culture even then, you know, and that's kind of the, the irony of this. They go, well, church discipline, that doesn't sound loving. Um, but, but then if you tweet or say something insensitive or not culturally hip right now, um, you kind of get the same treatment, right? Um, there's, there's still our standards is basically what I'm saying. And so I guess the question then is, what, what love are we operating under, right? Love of the world or love of God? Love of holiness or, or love of the approval of others? Um, I think those are, that's really the question. Before we even get to, is it loving to practice church discipline? I'm like, well, okay, well, what kind of love are we talking about, right? So we got to start by defining love, right? We, obviously, we can read 1 Corinthians 13. If you go to a wedding, you'll hear 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient, love is kind, right? We see all of that. Um, but also Jesus, multiple times throughout John, um, he says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. If you love me, you'll obey my commands. In fact, you can't say you love me and then hate your brother. You can't say you love me and then do blank, 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 right? He says, if you love me. So is it loving then? So basically then to love somebody is to be for their good, for their true, wholehearted, all-encompassing, I love this person and I want nothing more for them than their fullest life, which is what? Communion with Christ, right? That's really what it all comes down to. Their, their greatest good in all of life is always God. And so if we love them, we want that for them. We want that for them. And so then church discipline is basically just calling them to that. It's calling them to that. And it is loving, right? Because God is love, right? And so we're basically just going like, hey, we're, we're out of love. We're calling you to the one who is love. Um, so I think, yes, it is loving to practice church discipline. Um, again, I think there are unloving ways to do it, which I think I've kind of hopefully given us some good parameters around, um, but it is loving, okay? Um, I'll stop there. Do we have any questions?